Thank you, Holy Father. We come before your holy presence. Glorious Jesus. Wonderful Father. Oh, you are a good God. Your grace and mercy endures forever and ever. I see the Spirit of the Lord standing in our midst. And this is the word that he is speaking unto me. Indeed, I seek for fruit. Can I find fruit among the many trees that are here? There are some here I have come looking for five years, seven years, nine years. I have not found any. But because of the watchmen set around you, appointed for you through their pleadings, and through their prayers, you have been spared. I come looking for fruits. Bear and bring forth fruits. As the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of the Lord, is speaking these words, I see that some that bear fruit are artificial fruit. It is made to see that they are fruits, but they are artificial fruit, plastic toy fruits. They are not genuine. That comes from yoking together with the Holy Spirit. A fruit comes, the Holy Spirit shows me, through the dying of a seed. Unless there is death, unless there is a dying to yourself, no real fruit can come forth. The plans that you envision, the purpose that you plan to pursue, are they from me? Please check your heart right now. I see now the Lord Jesus Christ standing before me and looking at you. Thank you, wonderful Lord Jesus. Analyze before me. Come before me and ask me what are my plans for your life. Surely, I will be delighted to show you my plans and my purposes. Thank you, Holy Father. Lord, speak to them right now. Speak to them, Lord. Let your spirit now speak to them, Lord. As you are now standing before each and every one of them, I pray, Spirit of the Living God, thank you, Lord Jesus. Even as you are putting your hands upon their shoulders and upon their chest, let them tangibly feel that, Lord. Let them tangibly feel your touch on their chest and your left arm on their 
right shoulder. Let them feel that, Lord. Let them tangibly feel that anointing right now. Let them feel that burden of the Lord coming upon them right now. Let this word that you ask, Lord, have you sought my will? Have you sought my plans? Come upon them right now. Let it come, Lord, like a heavy burden upon their spirit right now. Thank you. Let each one of them, Lord, experience you right now. Right now, Lord Jesus. Even the brooding of the Holy Spirit. Let them feel your brooding in their spirit right now. Right now all within their hearts, all within their spirit. Let them feel your brooding, Lord. Let them feel your brooding. Let them feel your anointing, Lord. Thank you, wonderful Lord Jesus. Thank you, wonderful Lord Jesus. Let your word now come unto them, Lord. Let your word come unto them. Open their eyes, open their ears, open the ears of their understanding and let them hear your word right now, right now Lord. Thank you, thank you wonderful God, thank you wonderful God, oh you are a good God, thank you wonderful Lord Jesus. Thank you, wonderful Lord Jesus. I see an angel of God. Just come into this room right now. Thank you, wonderful God. He's bearing you some gifts that you are praying and asking him for. Thank you, wonderful God. Lord Jesus, whatever your children are asking you right now, whatever they are praying, Lord, I pray right now. Give them, Lord. Give them. Even when they are asking to know about their ministry plans, what they should do, how they should do, right now I pray, Lord, give them your scroll. Give them that scroll that they will know indeed you have called them. Indeed, you have planted them. Indeed, you have anointed them. Right now, Lord, give them that understanding. Thank you, Holy Father. Thank you, Holy Father. Oh, you are a good God. Your grace and mercy endures forever and ever. Let us lift up our holy hands. And bless the name of the living God who lives forever and ever. Thank you, wonderful Father. Oh, He's a good God. His mercy and grace endures forever and ever. Thank you, wonderful Father. I see many scrolls, or in fact one particular scroll, being unfurled right now on the floor of this church. I believe this concerns the plans of God for this church. As you gather here often to pray, especially in this center portion as the pastor and the church elders and the leaders pray God will make known to you what his plans are what you should do thank you indeed a revival is going to break out Amen. indeed it will break out Amen. set your heart upon the children set your heart 
and your mind upon the children. Ask of me what is my plan concerning them. Ask of me how to train them, teach them and prepare them to be part of my army. Thank you, wonderful God. Oh, you are a good God. Your grace and mercy endures forever and ever. Shall we one more time lift up our holy hands and bless the name of the living God who is good. He alone is good. His mercies endures forever and ever. Holy Father, open the eyes of our understanding that we may hear what the Spirit of God will speak to His church in these last days. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. You know, when I entered into this church, it is my tradition and my practice never, never to talk to the pastor or anybody in the church to which I'm going. I don't talk to them. I don't ask them anything about their church so that when I hear from the Lord, it is unadulterated. So that when I hear from the Lord, there's not even a doubt in my heart that I'm Hearing is not my imagination because I've already heard from the pastor or heard from the elders, the condition of the church. So all these years, ever since uh, how many years this church? Four years. These past four years, I've never ever talked with Pastor Stephen concerning their plans or their visions, what is their call, nothing. Once in a while when I, when I talk with my nephews, you know, I ask them, how's the church? Or sometimes they direct me to their Facebook concerning some pictures or some write-up about the condition of the church. But for a long time, there's been no update. <laughs> so every time I look up, no, is there any update? No update. <laughs> so I never, never talk with anybody. I always like to be alone. Even if the pastor or anybody wants to come and talk to me about anything, I say, please don't tell me anything right now. We can talk about it after, after the church service. So when I uh, came and sat at the, during the worship, this is the word that came to me for this. Okay, this is now not for everybody, just for this church. More could be said, but I will reserve the rest in, a, in an, uh, another private occasion. First Samuel 22, verse 2. This is the word that came to me. And everyone who was in distress, everyone who was in debt, and everyone who was discontented, and everyone who was discouraged. You have that sentence in your Bible? I just added that sentence. gathered themselves unto him, King David, and he became captain over them, and there were with him about 400 men. So the people that who were gathered around King David or were gathered unto him were this kind of people, not a happy bunch, you know. <laughs> All are problem, problem cases distressed people, people who are in debt, those who are discontented, those who are discouraged. So King David, like our pastor, must have a master's degree in social counseling. <laughs> <laughs> because when you have all these kind of problem people, they need a lot of counseling, right? So he counseled them. And what was the result of that? The distressed people, those who in debt, those who are discontented, those who are discouraged, 
became a mighty army mighty army and they become the mighty men of david that's how the bible calls the mighty men of david so i believe this is this kind of uh, people god will gather in this church distress debt discontented <laughs> Am I right? Is it correct? Is this your call? <laughs> Amen? Amen? So you should change the name of your church, you know, from uh, Jesus my King to Adulam Christian Fellowship. <laughs> All right. A few days ago, I was praying and asking the Lord what I should come and share with you since this is going to be like a general body what is the word of the lord or what i should come and speak with you and this is the word that i heard from the lord turn with me to habaka chapter 2 and we will read verse 20 habaka chapter 2 and the verse 20 and the scripture says but the lord is in his holy temple let all the earth keep silent the lord in his holy temple let all the earth keep silent when i was a new believer i used to attend a denominational church that always print the scripture only now i remember this you know they print the scripture on their church bulletin the lord in his holy temple let all earth keep silent but i find a lot of noises in the church you know when people enter into the church everybody are chatting and chatting and chatting and chatting and chatting what they are chatting i don't know you know everybody are just chatting so i used to read the scripture the lord in his holy temple let all the earth keep silence so the earth should keep silence not the people maybe that's how they read it the earth should keep silence we don't have to keep silent we can do all the talking but this is the word that came unto me for you the lord is in his holy temple let the earth keep silence now when you read the scriptures generally when you read the scriptures you must pay attention to some adjectives that are added there because they give us some extra information they are not written there for no rhyme or reason the scriptures could have said but the lord is in his temple right could have just said that the lord is in his temple but why did it say holy temple so you need to pay attention to the word holy there so let all the earth keep silence before him so what is earth is it just earth earth or what is earth if you read the scriptures in first kings chapter 6 verse 7 it says that when when king solomon commissioned the building of the temple all the chiseling all the hammering all the knocking all the cutting were done outside not inside the temple in the temple it was quiet the lord is in his temple no noises no chiseling no nothing was done to pollute the presence of the temple number 1 or to dirty the place the place where you gather if we believe that this place though it is physical if we believe that god is in our midst then it should be clean right it should be clean it should be orderly but many times we don't keep the place clean orderly because in our head we know that god comes but our heart is far from believing in it 
if we truly believe with all our heart that God is in our midst when we gather together, then our whole attitude changes. You know what is the fruit of that attitude? Fear of God and holiness. It automatically will spring forth fear of God. God is in His temple. Let's not talk unnecessarily. You know, sometimes when we conduct meetings in India, the awesome glory of God comes down. Every year, in the month of January, we conduct a youth camp meeting up in the Himalayan mountains. And not all the time, but sometimes when the awesome glory of God comes down, I'll always see a mighty angel come and stand before me. And he will first he will say, remove your shoes. So first I have to remove my shoe. And then I will instruct all the congregation, about 500 youths who come to a meeting, say, remove all your shoes now. I don't do this often. Because whether you put shoes on or you don't put shoes on, the whole Lord is always with, you, with us. But sometimes, when the awesome glory of God comes down, some of these things that pollutes, that defiles, have to be removed. You know, these are some mysteries. I don't have any clear-cut answers for you, except to say that it is biblical. In Exodus chapter 3 and in Judge, Joshua chapter 5, when Moses appeared before the burning bush, before he could touch on the very perimeter where the glory of God was shining, an angel told him, remove your shoes. And after he removed his shoes, only then he could step onto, within the perimeter of the glory. And in Joshua chapter 5, an angel of the Lord, the captain of the Lord's host, came and stood before him. And the angel, you know, just the mere presence of an angel, he said, now remove your shoes. You are standing in holy ground. Until he removed his shoes, they wouldn't talk with him. Only when he removed, see, it signifies pollution. It also signifies a surrender. It also signifies an attitude of obedience that you are willing to obey. So when we are willing to do that, then we are in a rightful position for God to speak with us. Awful presence comes. And when that awful, awesome presence of God came down, I saw a huge angel, about 15 foot tall, standing before me. And he stretched out a scroll. And a voice thundered about some of the works that needs to be done for various nations that were gathered in the place. So under such atmosphere, a holy hush comes over the entire congregation because the Lord is not just there by the Spirit, but He's physically there. His awesome presence is there. And in such moments, we want all flesh to be quiet, to be still and quiet. Let all the earth, with all its activities, with all the busyness, must be quiet. If you do all the talking all the while, how is God going to talk to us? Right? When I'm talking, you all are silently listening. If I'm talking and you are talking at the same time, we cannot understand each other. Am I right? Someone needs to be quiet. So many, many years ago, there was a dear friend of mine who has an accounting firm in Singapore, he asked me to pray for him. He said, please pray that God will speak to me. And he, he, he told me, you know, you know, when I go to churches, I, he was a very, very traditional Christian for many, many years. And then he got saved, got baptized in the Holy Spirit. And uh, he was starting his life in the Spirit. But he never felt anything in the church. He's always like a lock of wood. Are you there? You mean you are a wood? <laughs> yeah. 
So, and you know, the young people in his church, they used to give testimony, oh, I felt the Lord's presence, I felt this, I felt that. Everybody gives all kinds of testimonies, I felt the goosebump, I felt the red bumps. <laughs> and he tells me, no, you know, I don't even feel anything, not even a mosquito bite. <laughs> so he said, please pray for me. You always see the Lord. The next time when you see the Lord, please pray for me. I said, all right, brother, I'll pray for you. So, after many days later, during my period of intercession, as I was waiting on the Lord, I saw the Lord Jesus. And I was praying for the many needs for which people write to me. So, when I was true, I suddenly remembered this brother's request. So I told the Lord, Lord, I have one more request to ask you. So I brought my friend's problem to the Lord. I said, Lord, why you are so unfair? So the Lord looked at me as if he has never ever heard such a thing in his life before. Which is true, no? He's not unfair, right? He's unpartial. So he, why you are so unfair? So the Lord looked at me with that look on his face. And then I brought up my friend's problem. So I said, Lord, when you can do all these things to all other people, they feel this, they feel that, they feel goosebumps, they feel that. At least, Lord, send your angel to pinch him. <laughs> <laughs> At least a little pinch will do some good for him. If he can't hear your voice, he can't feel this, he can't see that, at least pinch him. Let him say, out! <laughs> that will be good enough. And the Lord listened with great patience to what I was saying. And then the Lord said, the problem is not with me, the problem is with him. I said, what do you mean, Lord, the problem is with him? He has a great desire to see you. He has a great desire to hear your voice. How can you say the problem is with him? The Lord looked at me and said, come, I'll show you. When he said that, he tapped me on my forehead. As soon as he tapped, I saw a vision of what happens in his house in a typical morning. So I saw this scene. He was getting ready to go to work. He gathered his ch three children. They all got dressed and they fed them. Uh, he and his wife fed them quick breakfast and they all knelt down to pray. So when they all prayed, each one, one by one, they prayed. Then this brother prayed. He said, Lord, bless my three children, bless my wife, bless my uh, mother, bless my father, bless my pastor. And he named a few ministers of God that he knew. He said, bless everybody, Lord. All this while, as he was praying, I saw the Lord Jesus standing by his side. You know, that day, I saw and realized one thing. Whenever we, whenever we pray, God comes to hear our prayer. Amen. Amen. Whether we see or we don't see, that doesn't matter. When we pray, he's in our midst. I saw that with my own eyes that day. So then he prayed. As he was about to end his prayer, he said, Lord, please speak to me, Lord. When he said that sentence, I saw the Lord Jesus. Now, the Lord was also standing by my side. At the same time, we are, I was seeing a vision into the past. And in the past vision, the Lord was also standing by his side. And when he said, Lord, please speak to me, the Lord opened his mouth to say something, and then he said the next sentence, in Jesus' name I pray, Amen. <laughs> you know, we laugh at this uh, incident, but this is exactly what we do every day. Right? This is exactly what we do every day. And then the Lord turned and looked at me and he said, now do you understand what I meant when I said the problem is not with me, but the problem is with him? Then the Lord said a statement that I have never forgotten for the rest of my life till today. My children have no time to wait on me. They have no time to wait on me. They want me to behave like instant Maggi noodles. That's the exact uh, word the Lord said. 
they want me to behave like instant Mackey noodles. Two minutes, everything is done. This is the reason why we are not progressing in our spiritual life. Forever, we always remain as turkeys instead of being eagles. You're not called to be a turkey, you know. If you're called to be a turkey, you'll end up on someone's dinner table on Thanksgiving Day. You're called to be eagle, soaring up like eagles in the high places in the heavenly realm. That's our call. That's the call of every minister. That's the call of every believer. That's the call of every church. You're seated together in the heavenly places, not down on earth. So why are we so weak, helpless, like what I just read to you, no? In distress, in debt, discontented, discouraged. Why? Because we are not planted in the Lord. You can be planted in a house of God, but are you planted in the Lord? Being a member of a church, running around all conferences, does not really feed you until you are planted in the Lord. Unless and until you are planted in the Lord, you will forever be discontented, you will forever be distressed, you will forever be discouraged, you will forever be unhappy. Something is missing. You know, there is a huge mighty tree in the U.S. called the sequoia tree. The sequoia tree grows up to 300 feet tall. And they are so big, so white. So, no matter what kind of storms come and blow on the tree, they may just sway a little bit, but they are rooted and strongly planted. No storms, no tornado, no hurricane can blow them apart. So, some biologists, they wanted to discover what is the secret to the strength of this tree. So, they duck under the roots of one particular tree and they discovered that the roots go miles deep into the earth and then they go sideways miles and are planted deeply in the soil and also connected to the root source or water source under that flows underneath the earth. Planted. This is the life that the God is calling us to, to be planted. We, sh we should be planted in a garden, rather be a potted plant. You know what's the difference between a potted plant and a planted plant? A planted plant stays. A potted plant travels around. A potter plant can be removed from place to place, you know, for decoration. They are only for decoration, good for decoration. But a planted plant is in a fixed place, planted and brings forth fruit. Potter plant doesn't bring forth fruit. It's only for decoration purpose. You know, in our office in India, we have many, many potted plants. So sometimes the housekeeper, they come and they change the position. One moment they are here, next moment they change over another place. So when I ask them, why have they done this? They say, oh, just to make the place look nice. So that it's not boring, always in the same position all the time. That's what a potted plant is. You go church hopping. Potted plants do that, you know. They go church hopping. Don't like this church, go to the next church. Don't like that church, go to the next church. But why we don't change our parents? Don't like this parent, change another. (laughs) (laughs) 
don't like this mother change another mother <laughs> we can't do that right whether you like your mother or you don't like your mother that is your mother likewise where does god want you to be planted firstly planted in the lord are you planted in the lord you know in the years to come or from this year onwards there's much much storms that are going to blow upon the face of this earth much storms persecutions are going to come upon many nations it has already started in india with the new government that we have in india right now from may of last year now persecutions have slowly started to increase against the christians it's not done uh, secretly they are done openly they're clamping down on the preaching uh, of rights of the christians so what has started in one nation will sweep over to many many nations and unless and until you are planted in a good ground now that comes to the next point not just planted in the ground you need to be planted in a good ground we cannot just simply throw the seed on the street by the wayside you cannot throw the seeds on the stony ground you cannot throw the seeds on thorny ground you need to throw the seeds on the good ground so you must know which is the good ground that you need to be planted not just any ground all ground is ground you know but there's only one good ground so you need to find which is the good ground that you need to be planted so when you're planted in the good ground then it will bring forth a lot of fruit sometimes a ground may not be good but a good farmer can turn a bad ground into good ground about 15 years ago we had an office in uh, jalan jalita and uh, i planted many plants in our little garden that we had so one particular tree was not growing at all all other trees were growing so i was wondering why this particular tree was not growing and that tree was my favorite tree you know so i was wondering something must be wrong so i i call a gardener i ask him what is the problem with this tree why this tree is not growing so he dug around the soil and he did some little research and then he told me sir they are not good soil in this ground so we need to dig deep down take out the tree careful that the roots are not cut and then dig the ground further put good manure good soil good fertilizers then we'll replant the tree back into that ground i said all right do it so he did that and after a little while so so after putting the tree back he told me sir please make sure for the next one week you water the plants three times a day i told him i will water five times a day <laughs> that's not a problem i want this tree to grow so i did that make sure the water is well watered the plant well watered three times a day and after the second week onwards the plant began to grow very well so sometimes the ground may not be good the church where you are planted you feel that it may not be good this is not good but a good gardener now this is this is where the praying people come the watchmen when they pray they can help the pastor dig the ground god can show us what are some of the problem areas and then when they dig the ground okay let's redo it again let's change this or change that put according to the plan of god then we rearrange reshuffled okay these things is not right before god's eyes let's put them all away change and reorder and then the plant will start growing up again so 
we need to be planted where we need to be planted. God wants to reign in his temple. When we say God is in his temple, he not just wants to be in the temple for like being a visitor. He wants to reign in the temple. When he wants to reign, the flesh must not rule anymore. If you read Zechariah chapter 2 verse 13, it says, The Lord is in his temple. Let all flesh keep silent. The flesh must not rule. Now what do we mean by the flesh? Okay, let me give you an example. If you read Deuteronomy 32 verse 12, it says that the Lord alone led Israel by himself all during the 40 years of the sojourn in the wilderness. No other foreign gods led them. The Lord alone led them. But there was a group of people who want to be the leaders. Four of them. Among the four, the chief are Dathan and Korah. They wanted to usurp the power and the authority that rested upon Moses. And they wanted to be the leaders. If you read Numbers chapter 16, you'll find the story there. So there was a contention for leadership. Though they were from the they were distant relatives to Moses, you know. They are all from the same tribe, Levitical tribe. Moses is from the Levite tribe. So they are distant relatives to Moses. Yet, there was a power struggle. The question was, why must Moses alone be the leader? Why there be one leader? Let's have a collective leadership. You know, when you go for that kind of a collective leadership, then the flesh starts ruling. Everybody will start pulling the church in different direction. Let's go this way, Go. let's go that way. All pull in different direction. You know, I remember when God called me to organize the first youth camp meeting in, in the Darjeeling in 1997. So I fasted for 40 days and asked the Lord for a plan how the youth meeting should be done. Because I, I'm never a youth person, you know. A youth pastor, I don't have any calling for the youths. So this was something new for me to do. So I got a plan from God. This is how the meetings need to be organized. This is what needs to be done. Every day what needs to be done. So among the things that God told me to do was to serve communion at, at the end, on the last session of the camp meeting. So as to seal everything that God has done. So in the initial, when we first organized this camp meeting, I had all the pastors in our town to help me organize this camp meeting. So we had a pastors from eight different churches who are very good friends of mine, and we formed a little committee. So we, t we told them what the vision, what the plans, and then they help us to get some volunteers to manage the camp meeting. So... I could not attend all the committee meetings every time, so my staffs attended on my behalf. So as we kept on discussing the everyday planning of the camp meeting, so a question came that we were going to serve communion on the last day of the camp meeting. So one pastor protested, said, no, we should not serve communion. I said, why? Because this is not a church setting. You should only serve communion in the church. One pastor protested. Another pastor says, no, you cannot give communion because in our churches, we only give communion to all those who are baptized, registered members of the church. So these are, I'm sh sharing with you some traditions in India. No? I don't know about Singapore. And uh, one by one, everybody said something. I listened very quietly to all their oppositions, of their objections. So then I told them, very, very respectfully, I said, my dear pastor, when I come to your church, I will obey your rules. But this is my meeting. In my meeting, I will do what God tells me to say. 
what God tells me to do. This is how God wants it to be done, and this is how we will do. Please don't bring your church rules to my meeting. When I come to your church, I will obey your rules. If you said even a preacher from outside cannot take a minute, I will obey. <laughs> but this is my meeting. So they were quite unhappy. But they still cooperated. <laughs> See, God wanted to lead Israel by himself with his ways. And Moses, his prophet, heard what God told him and just repeated to the people what God said. Period. Moses did not lead the people. It was God who led the people. But Korah and Dayton wanted to form a committee of four elders together with many other princes of Israel to form a big consensus committee to do their way. See, the Lord was in his temple, in their midst. All flesh should remain quiet. But the flesh did not keep quiet. The flesh began to make a lot of noise. As a result, the judgment of God came upon them. And that, that was the end of the committee meeting. Good to have committee meeting. I told my committee, you know, I told all the pastors, look, the committee is not to help me make decisions. You are supposed to help me. This is the plan from God. And this is how we are going to carry it out. So to carry it out, I need you to help me. But don't bring the flesh into the picture. You don't bring the flesh in. If this is what God says, this is how it needs to be done, this is how it needs to be done. We don't alter the plan of God, whether we like it or we don't like it. Now, when God wants to abide in our midst, that has been his desire from the beginning of time. God wants to abide in our midst. If you read Exodus 25 verse 8, the very purpose that God asked Moses to build the temple or the tabernacle was for God to abide in their midst. He said, build me a tabernacle that I may dwell in your midst. That's the very purpose. Because of sin, God cannot abide in our midst anymore. But there must be a medium, a vehicle through which God can have a legal right to abide in our midst. And that medium or that vehicle is the tabernacle. And the purpose is not to create just a church to have a large church membership. No. The purpose is for God to dwell in our midst. And now in the new covenant, by the blood of Jesus Christ, the Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians 6.16 that you are the temple of God. Now, if you read the scripture very carefully, if you all don't mind, please turn with me to 6, 16, 2 Corinthians 6, 16. You will be surprised to find that it is written there, just like how God dwelled in the midst of Israel and walked among them. It's in a similar manner that he wants to abide within us. And what agreement had the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Now, we don't have problem with the first part. I will dwell in them. But what about the second part where it says, I will walk in them. What does that mean, I will walk in them? It's not just a presence that abides in you. It's a living presence of God. The Shekinah presence of God itself having a living personal encounter with you. Where you walk with God like Enoch walked. It is not something that is impossible to attain. It is absolutely possible. In 1991, 
on my very first visit to the US, the Lord called me to fast for 40 days. On the 37th day of my fast, I fell into a trance. And in the trance, I saw the Ark of the Covenant. It appeared before me. And from within the wings of the cherubim, a voice spoke to me. When I saw that, I understood what and how the prophet Moses must have felt during his times. I looked all around, you know, and just from within the center, you know, now my voice is coming from the speaker boxes. So if I ask you where my voice is coming from, you can point your finger directly at the source from where it was coming from. But when God's voice spoke from between the wings of the cherubim, you cannot point your finger at a source there, this is where it's coming from. It appears just from the center. But which center? That's another question. Which center? And the voice said, read Exodus 30. So I quickly turned to the book of Exodus 30 and I read it. It talked about the furnitures in the tabernacle. And then for the next one and a half hours, the Lord spoke to me about the various furnitures in the tabernacle. He said, every one of the furniture speaks about one type of prayer. And I eventually wrote a book called The Prayer Secrets in the Tabernacle. And this is what the Lord said. When a person follows the six furniture in the tabernacle, starting from the outer court, the altar of burnt sacrifice, the lever of washing, then the candle stand, then the table of showbread, then the altar of incense. When you move all these five furniture, finally you come before the Ark of the Covenant, the sixth furniture. When you come before the Ark of the Covenant, God will speak with you. And God will, you can see God face to face. And the Lord told me one thing that aged into my heart from that moment onwards. He said, my desire to many serve myself to my people is more than their desire to see me. I was stunned, stunned by that sentence, you know. So I said, if that is true, Lord, then why is it that you are not manifesting yourself more to your people? And again, he repeated, Be because they have no time to wait on me. When you wait on God, how can God not talk with you? When you wait on God, how cannot God manifest himself to you? The Bible says, you know, you cannot go wrong, right? If you read John chapter 14, verse 21 and 23, it says, if anyone loves me and keeps my word and does them, I will manifest myself to them. So when you keep the word of God, you meditate the word of God, you practice the word of God day by day by day by day. You know what it does? The word cleanses you. The word purifies you. The word sanctifies you. The word cleanses you. Day by day by day, it transforms you to see the Lord who is standing before you. The Lord just doesn't suddenly appear to you, you know. He's always there. It's just that we have spiritual cataracts. The cataracts needs to be removed from our eyes. Once the cataracts are removed, then you can see the object that is before you very, very clearly. God doesn't show himself only to those in the full-time ministry or to the apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. No. This scripture, 2 Corinthians 6.16, 6, says, for everybody, for everybody, so every blood-washed believer, whether they are young or old, is a rightful candidate to be a son of God, to be a daughter of God, to see his holy face. Right? You know, when a baby is born, just comes out of the mother's womb, the doctor who takes out the baby, the first thing he does is show to the mother, see, see your baby. Right? And then the father will also be there. 
and then they say, see, see, see your baby, or the father takes the baby, now the father can be in the maternity ward, and he can help in the delivery, right? I've seen that in the, in the US, they allow that now, the father to have the surgeon to deliver the baby out. So the father is the first person to hold the baby, not the doctor. So he sees the baby, and the baby opens his eyes and sees the father's face. Not any other baby sees the father's face. No, the own, your own, your own baby sees the own father's face. So you are a child of God. You have a rightful inheritance. You can rightfully demand, Abba Father, you are my father. And I have the right to see my father's face. You have the right, right? A person on the street doesn't have the right. But the child of the family has the right to see the father's face and to go all the way into the innermost recesses of the father's house. Only the child has the rights. So why are you not claiming your rights? But we are behaving like adopted children, you know. We are just behaving like adopted children. The adopted children don't have, don't feel a sense of real belonging. When I was growing up, I had a friend who is our neighbor. So this boy and I used to play, you know, and, uh, and nobody knew that this boy was adopted. Even he himself did not know. And he would, he was a real troublemaker to the parents. And the parents really adored him. They had one daughter and then this boy. And they will put up with him for all the nonsenses he does, for all the pains that he do for them. Then one fine day, when he was much older, maybe when he was a teenager, the mother told him, or the sister, in a fit of anger and a fight, sibling fight, she said, oh, you, you are an outsider. You know, siblings always use these kind of words, no? And uh, so he also said, if I'm an outsider, you are a kampong person. So it goes from one to another to another until finally the sister in a fit of anger, in a slip of a tongue, she said, oh, you are an adopted child. The boy was shocked. And the mother was shocked. And then when he went and double-checked with his mother, when the mother affirmed that what his sister was said was true, his whole demeanor changed after that. He truly felt that he was an outcast. He felt he did not belong to this family any longer because he's adopted. Many Christians behave like that. Instead of feeling that you are a child of the family of God, you behave like an adopted person. You feel that there is a vast gap between you and God, that you cannot come and approach God. A sense of adoption. Now you need to tear that down today. Because you are not adopted. You are born into the family of God. Amen. Born into the family. And you are born into the family and God has poured into us the spirit of adoption. Whereby we call him Abba Father. So you need to change that attitude. I am a child of God. I'm not adopted. I'm not second hand. Take away that thought. You're not second hand. You're not second best. You are the best. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. You are the best. You know, when I walked into this church and I was sitting in the standing there in the pew. The Lord Jesus came and told me one thing. He said, in this meeting, he's going to heal many, many broken hearts. I do not know what are the condition of your hearts. I'm just telling you what the Lord told me earlier on. He's going to heal many, many broken hearts, especially those who also have lost their hopes. 
Thirdly, those who feel that you have lost your calling, it is not lost. It's there. It's not lost. Your calling is not lost. Your hope is not lost. Your dignity, whatever you feel that you have lost, it will be restored back to you. Amen. Not once, not twice, but seven times. Amen. So, be of good cheer. Be of good cheer. Even as 